We've heard the term spirit filled. That's a, it's kind of a buzzword, spirit filled. This idea of being, well, it means a lot of things, I think, to different people, depending on who you ask. Some people might say that something is spirit filled if it's exciting, right? It's like, man, this, the worship was really spirit filled today. I've heard people say that. Or I've heard a version of that. Which means something is spirit filled. It means that God did something supernatural amongst us. Like, man, today was really spirit filled. But the Bible uses that term in a little bit of a different way. And that's what I'm going to argue for today. Because last week we were in Ephesians 5 18 and we talked about alcohol and drunkenness and God's commands for us in regards to alcohol that He's given us. And we said, that verse 18 says, do not be filled with alcohol, do not be drunk with alcohol, with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And I told you that we were going to spend this week talking about what it is to be filled with the Spirit. And so that's exactly what we're going to do today. So Ephesians 5, 19 through 21 is where, where we are. If you'll give me just a second. My wonderful technology is giving me trouble today. Ephesians 5.19. If I can get there. I'll read it from the bulletin today then. And then we'll open this up too. Ephesians 5.19 says this. Be filled with the Spirit. That's the first part there. Addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And making melody... To the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Amen. Let me pray for us, and then we'll open this up together. Lord God, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for all the ways that you have blessed us and all the ways that you lead us. And guide us by your word. And we ask today that you would do your work through your word and your people through me this morning. God, may I decrease so you can increase. In Jesus' name, amen. So the reason I say today we're going to talk about being filled with the Spirit is because what he gives us here are three participial phrases, if you want to be a grammar nerd with me today that are related to that one command, be filled with the Spirit. And he says we do that by addressing one another in Psalms, by giving thanks, and by submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So we've got to start with this idea, what does that mean to be filled with the Spirit? What is he saying? Well, there's something that's immediately interesting to me about that command, and that is that he is speaking to Christians, okay? We've already read Ephesians 1.13, which says, In him you also... When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So he's already told the Ephesians and us by extension that when you heard and believed, you were filled with the Spirit. So he can't mean here when he says be filled with the Spirit that you need some additional Holy Spirit or anything like that. Because if you're already filled with the Spirit... The Holy Spirit is one of the persons of the Trinity. He is God himself. He is not a force or a substance or a fluid that could be poured into you in a physical sense. So it's not like you can get more of the Spirit in a quantitative way. Okay, you either have him or you don't. You're either filled with the Spirit or you're not. So what does he mean by be filled with the Spirit? If he already lives in us, what does that mean? I think we have a clue in Ephesians 4.30 where he says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And then again, he says something similar in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. He says, don't quench the Spirit or don't extinguish the Spirit. And so there are things that we can do, like we said in verse 18, getting drunk being one of them, that I think grieve the Holy Spirit and quench the Spirit and in a sense displace the Spirit from the throne of our lives. In other words, we can work with Him and allow Him to work in us or we can get in his way and work against him and obstruct him from working in us. Here's another passage that I think makes a similar point, which is Romans 
where he says, don't present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. So again, this, this idea that these are already Christians. And he says, now you, you've been free from sin. You're no longer slaves. But now you have the choice to make. Are you going to offer yourself to sin still? Or are you going to offer yourself to righteousness? Which I think kind of points to the same idea. That we play an active role with God in our sanctification and our holiness and in pleasing Him. And the Holy Spirit doesn't come in and, and push us aside. He dwells in us and works alongside us. And so in a real sense, I think we can say that we become partners or the Holy Spirit becomes partners with us in our own righteousness and holiness and obedience and mission. And He empowers us and strengthens us and encourages us and prays for us and helps us. But we also have to strive and seek and do and act in a way that cooperates with the Spirit instead of getting in His way. And so then as we live in a way that is Spirit-filled, then we also begin to experience the closeness with God that He intends for us. And I'm convinced that all of that is what is meant here by be filled with the Spirit. And so with that in mind, here are the three ways that He says that we live a Spirit-filled life or the ways that the Holy Spirit works in us and, and pours out from us and from a heart filled with God. And that is number one, that we sing with other believers. Sing with other believers. Sing. Verse 19 says, Addressing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. And this is not an unusual command in Scripture, right? God's people are a singing people. They have been all along. Songs run all throughout the Bible. Moses sang. Deborah sang. Hannah sang, David sang, Zechariah sang. And those are just a few examples of the songs of God's people. God even inspired a whole book of songs called the Psalms, which we read from this morning. But those were intended to be sung to and by and among God's people. And so it's not surprising that this passage encourages us to sing as a function of being filled with the Spirit. What is interesting to me here is how many different ways he says to sing. He says sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and just sing in general and make melody to the Lord with your heart. And just a side note here, the, the very fact that he gives so many options there indicates to me that there's not just one acceptable form of praise. There's not just one genre of worship music. There are all kinds of songs that please the Lord. And that what really counts is that the melody isn't just being made by your mouth, but by your heart. That's what he says. That it flows from a genuine heart of praise. And that you actually love God and actually mean the words that you say. Because you can sing songs all day long. But if they don't come from a real place in your heart, they don't mean much. And so, we have these five different words and phrases that all point us to the same command. Which is sing to each other about the glory of God. And notice that it doesn't just say sing to God. It says address one another. Speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And this doesn't mean that all of our conversations have to be songs, like we're in a musical or something, right? If you've seen Lyle the Kindly Viking from Veggie Tales way back in the day, one of the characters is just, he keeps singing. And he says, why are you singing? He says, because it's a musical, right? That's not what our life is supposed to be. That's not what he means. What I think he's getting at is that we're supposed to be singing to and with each other. And that when we do that, we get this special glimpse of what heaven is going to be like. And the Spirit moves in us in a unique way. And when we gather as a church every Sunday morning, we have this unique and socially acceptable time to do exactly that. We call it corporate worship. But it's this thing that we did just a few minutes ago where we all sing together to one another and to God about Him. Where we all praise His name as one voice. And we're not just singing to God, we're singing to each other about God in a really real sense. And I wonder if you ever think about it that way. Because I forget that too, right? I th we think of worship as purely focused on Him. And that's true. And there are those times where you're by yourself and it is just you and God. But when you're in church, it's not just you and God. It's never just you and God when you're in church. It's you and your brothers and sisters in Christ singing to God together. And that's part of the reason that I try to sing really loud 
when I'm in church. And I would encourage you to do the same because I'm not just praising God. I'm praising God in the hearing and the presence of all of you as well. And I'm doing that for your upbuilding and for mine and for my encouragement and for yours and for the glory of God and his blessings to us. Like it's this thing where we all do it together with God and it's this blessed holy moment where we address one another, making melody to the Lord from our heart. Because I don't know about you, but my heart is revived when I hear you guys sing. And when I'm not all the way there on Sunday morning, and when one of my children is crying in my ear, hearing you guys sing to the Lord around me lifts up my soul. And it points me toward Him, and it fills me with the Spirit in that sense. And not necessarily because the melody is perfect, but because of the heart behind it. Because there is some kind of extra blessing of Godward music sung in community and fellowship with each other that is just different than when we're praising God alone. And so singing together and to each other and with each other is meant to be this clear sign and activity of the Holy Spirit inside every believer. And genuine praise always is and must be empowered by the Spirit and filled with the Spirit. And there's a reason, I think, that the world looks at the church and is confused by the fact that we sing all the time. I don't know if you've ever encountered that, but I've had people ask me, and I've seen, I've seen jokes made about the fact that we sing because they don't get it. They just don't understand. But we get it, right? We, we know. We know that something is happening when we sing together to God, and that we who are in Christ, filled with His Spirit, are doing something supernatural when we sing together. And so, if you're not a good singer, that's not the point. The point is that we praise and celebrate God from the heart with one another for his glory, for our good. And if you sing well, sing loud. And if you don't sing well, have an honest and genuine heart and sing loud anyway. Here's number two. We live a life filled with the spirit as we thank God for everything. So thank God for everything. Thank God for everything. Verse 20 says, giving thanks always, always, and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Always and for everything. I wasn't ready for this verse this week because I don't know if I've ever fulfilled that command in one day in my life to thank God always and for everything. Because when I think of giving thanks to God, I immediately think of all the good things in my life, like the, the counting my blessings I think of my wife and my kids and my family and my house and my car and my bed. I thank God for electricity and for running water and food to eat. But according to the Apostle Paul here, that is an incomplete list. Because he has something more in mind, and I think something way more. It's not just thanksgiving for the good things in life, but also for the the trials and the difficulties and the challenges. I think that's exactly what he means when he says, Give thanks always and for everything. And a part of the reason I think that is because of what James says in James 1, 2, and 2 through 4, where he says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So he just comes out of the gate swinging and says, Count it all joy when you meet trials. And does that mean we don't grieve or does that mean we can't hurt or that we have to enjoy everything that comes our way? That's not what he means. What he means is that we should count everything as joy. You don't have to count something as joy if it already is. If it's something you enjoy on its own, you don't have to count it as joy. But what we have to do with our trials and what he encourages and commands us to do is to learn to thank God for the trial too. And not just for the pain that it causes, and not really even at all for the pain that it causes. We're not masochists, right? We're not thanking God for pain. We're thanking God for what it produces in us, and for the maturity and endurance and faith that it's producing in us, for the sin that it might be breaking off of us, and for the holiness that He is wringing out of us in the crucible, and for the rod and staff of the Good Shepherd who is leading us in paths of righteousness, even when the path leads through the valley of the shadow of death, because in the darkness and in the difficulty, sometimes we experience the goodness and the presence of God like no other place on earth. And so he says, give thanks always and for everything. 
But this kind of thankfulness is really only possible in the light of the goodness and the sovereignty of God. Like Romans 8, 28 tells us that we know for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. That God is always working, that he doesn't allow or cause anything that is not ultimately good for those who love him. And that is part of the amazing goodness of God is that he can take things that on their own are bad or even evil and work them for good and for glory. And Paul says, give thanks, not just give thanks to God, but give thanks in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because we also, we don't just need the goodness and sovereignty of God. We need the reality of the cross as well. Because Romans 8 basically goes on to say that Jesus is the reason and the guarantee that all things work together for good. Because he already paid the price And he already overcame death and he already purchased eternal life for us. And because of that, we can have hope that God is for us and with us and doing something good for us always. Romans 8.31, the continuation kind of of that passage says, What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things. And so because all things are working together for good for those who are in Christ, and because all things are ultimately gifts of God to those who are in Christ, we can and should give thanks always and for everything. Imagine the peace that would dwell in your heart if you learned to give thanks for everything. And if you were to be able to count everything as a gift from God for your good and for his glory. And I wonder if that's part of what he's getting at in Philippians 4, when he says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Like we ask God for everything we need as we thank him for everything that he's already given. Everything. And then at that point, the peace comes to guard our hearts and our minds because we have reframed our outlook and situated our souls by God's help in the reality that he is good, he is with us, he is for us. Christ has already paid our debt. The Holy Spirit dwells in us. We are secure and held fast by the goodness of God. Because it's easy to get in this mindset of, well, I'm just unlucky. And that's a really dark way to live to think, well, I'm just unlucky, or bad things just happen to me. But if you're in Christ, neither of those things is true. Luck doesn't exist. That's something we made up. And if Jesus is in you and you are in him, then nothing bad ultimately ever happens to you. That God is working all those things together for good. And as the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, this light and momentary affliction, meaning all the sufferings of life, that's what he's talking about, are preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. That God is always in the mix and that our sufferings and our afflictions are doing something for us. They are preparing us for and preparing for us an eternal weight of glory and a whole pile of heavenly joy that will last forever. And so this kind of attitude of thankfulness is essential, but it's also supernatural. Again, we're talking about being filled with the Spirit. This is not something that you can do if you don't know God or if you are outside of Christ. You can get glimpses of gratitude, but if you don't know the one to whom you are meant to be thankful, you can't do it. But we know Him, and we we know Him. And He is living in us and empowering that kind of gratitude as we strive with Him. And so as we are filled with the Spirit, we can give thanks to God always and for everything. Here's the last one. Number three is submit to one another. Submit to one another. Verse 21 says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. The Greek verb translated as submit is hupotasso. And that is important because it's used a lot of other times in the Bible. And it means something like to make oneself subject, especially to another person. Or another way we might phrase that is to yield to or follow another person. And I think this verse has been widely misunderstood by many Christians to mean something like 
be a pushover. And I've heard people kind of defend that interpretation. It's like, well, you know what? You never need to stand up for yourself. Um, you just need to submit to one another and let people run over you. And it's like, well, that's not what he means. In fact, I think this is kind of a heading for the rest of chapter 5 and the beginning of chapter 6, where he's about to list three specific relationships where there's meant to be a leader and a follower. Husbands and wives, that's next week. Then children and parents, and then servants and masters. And then that context helps us to better understand what he means here in verse 21, to submit to one another. Let me give you a few more submission commands that use that same Greek word. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God, and resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. So primarily, and as he's already said, out of reverence for Christ, we do this. All of us are submitted to God first. And we do what he asks and what he commands, or we should be trying to, because he's ultimately the king. And then Romans 13, 1 says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted. By God. So here's another submission relationship that we all find ourselves in to some extent that out of a a reverence and a submission to God, we submit to government. And here's 1 Peter 5 5. He says, You who are younger, be subject to the elders. Close yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And the context there, what he means by elders is pastors and shepherds, overseers, that office of church leader. And the overall point here being this, that God in his wisdom has created authority structures in all kinds of places within the world. And they're a blessing and a gift to us because they bring order out of chaos. So when husbands are allowed to lead their families and wives are submissive to the leadership of their husbands, there is good and blessed order. And when children obey their parents and parents discipline their children, there is order. And when governments create and enforce good laws and citizens do their best to live according to those laws, again, there's order. And when pastors lead well and church members respect that leadership, there is order. And order is a great blessing in a chaotic and fallen world. Because as we know, things tend to fall apart. Human nature is broken and damaged by sin. And so we tend toward moral and societal chaos. We are blessed here in America and in the West generally, by civilization. But it's new. It's new in the world, and it's generally been found by force. And yet, we ought to be leaning into that in so many ways. If you want to go and see what the world could look like without order, you can go as close to us as Haiti. There's not a lot of order there, and it's a hard place to live. Or you go to North Africa, like we prayed for this morning, there's not a lot of order. There's a lot of chaos, and it's a hard place to live. But Christians are called to bring order and structure to the world around us. Because order is part of the peace and blessing and flourishing and life and goodness that God wants for us. And so he calls us and commands us to submit to one another. Again, not to be pushovers, but to honestly recognize our place in the order of the world. And to lead where we ought to and to follow where we ought to. But I do think there is a little bit something else baked into this command, and that is that we should all of us be striving for a heart of humility. 1 Corinthians 13, the love passage, says this about love, that love is patient and kind. It doesn't envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. And it does not insist on its own way. And I especially want to zoom in on that phrase, that love does not insist on its own way. Because the literal translation of those words would be something like, Love does not try to obtain its own or to obtain itself. And that to me is really relevant here because even as I'm saying that this command to submit to one another doesn't mean that we're supposed to become totally passive. It does mean that when we do lead and when we do fight for our convictions and we do try to persuade people and to object to things or when we share our opinions or whatever, that we're supposed to do that in a humble way and in a loving way that wants other people to come to the truth that we found rather than to enforce it on everybody else or that wants what is best for everyone instead of just what is best for ourselves and in a way that takes people into account. In other words, what he says in Philippians 2, 3, and 4, which is do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Because that is the heart of submitting to one another. 
that we count other people as more important than ourselves. And not because other people are more important than ourselves, because every human being has the same value before God. We bear his image, and so we are all valuable by nature of what God has made us to be. But the reason that we lovingly care for and serve one another and submit to one another is out of a reverence for Christ. And we submit to each other because we are all submitted to him. And sometimes you love people genuinely and it's easy to serve them and to submit to them. And some people you are working on loving them and they're harder to love or you don't really know them yet. And that is a lot harder to do. But he says we do it out of reverence for Christ. In other words, if Christ is your king, when you love somebody who is hard to love, you're loving Jesus. And when you serve somebody that's hard to serve, you're ultimately serving him. And this too, again, is a supernatural act. Our fallen hearts naturally want their own way. We want power over other people. We want things to go the way we want them to go. But that is almost never what is best for us or for anybody else. But being filled with the Spirit changes things. And God recreating us from the inside out enables us to put ourselves aside sometimes and to care about the needs of other people and to give and care and serve in ways that we otherwise wouldn't. And to embrace authority even as a gift from God and not a burden or a curse. But to submit to one another. And so as we end this morning, we have three things to think about. And they seem, these seem disjointed. And that's why I've been coming back to this uniting idea that this is what life is filled with the Spirit. This is what the Holy Spirit is bringing out of us in these different areas. Do you sing to God? That's the first question. And if you're, if you're a great singer, that's easier. But if you say, you know, I can't carry a tune to save my life, sing anyway, right? Sing to him. Get your heart right and then let that overflow into love for him and praise for him. Are you grateful for everything? The more that you cultivate that with God's help, the more you recognize his goodness and sovereignty and the blessings that Christ has blessed you with and the promise that all things are working together for good, we can strive toward that with him. And lastly, are you properly submitted to God and to others? Or do you have this rebellious streak in you that is anti-authority and that just wants to be the king of your own kingdom? Because remember, as Christians... These are things we're striving toward. This kind of Christ-likeness. This, this life that pleases God in every way. But we aren't trying to earn our way into acceptance with God. And that's an essential place to start. Because we already have our acceptance by faith in Jesus. And we're not working towards salvation. We're working from salvation. Salvation comes by faith alone and Christ alone. It's God's grace to us, not our works. So you already have that. If Jesus is your Savior and your King, you have that already. So now from that place, now we sing. Now we strive to be grateful. Now we submit to God and to others. And all of this, or none of this, is the result of human effort. And these are supernatural activities that the Holy Spirit has empowered each of us to do. So I'm also not asking you this morning to try to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, so to speak, because that's an impossible thing. That's why I like that phrase. You can't, you know, your bootstraps. You just can't do that. And what God is asking us to do are things that we are not ultimately able to do in our broken state. But God, by his Holy Spirit living in us, is able to empower us to do more than we ever could on our own. And so he calls us to sing because his spirit is in us, singing through us. And he calls us to be grateful because the Holy Spirit is bringing God's goodness to mind and empowering us to a gratitude not our own. And he calls us to submit to one another, not as a function of our own broken hearts, but as the Holy Spirit empowering us to be the people that God has called us to be, to fill the roles that he has uniquely suited us to fill. And so as you try to walk these things out, don't do them alone. Call on God's help. Rely on him. Recognize that he is working in you, willing and working for his good pleasure. And then lastly, if you're here this morning and this all is new or you don't know God at all or you're not in Christ, none of these things are going to be possible for you. And I'm not telling you that to discourage you, but I'm saying that the one thing you need most, that all of us need most, is to be righted in our relationship with God. 
that we are here on the foundation of the fact that Jesus lived the life that we could not live and that he died the death that we deserve and that he rose again to defeat death and now he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God and he welcomes us and invites us by faith to take hold of him as the one who can wash our sins away, the one who by his blood can make us clean and right with God. And so that's the place where you have to begin. All of us have to begin. And so if you're not there, first you need faith. And then from that point of faith, now we work. Let me pray for us. Lord God, we thank you this morning for the gift of your word. And not just of your word, but for the gift of Jesus who paid our price, who stood in as the sacrifice for our sins, who is our way and truth and life through whom nobody gets to the Father except through Him. Lord, we ask today that if there is anyone here who is not in Christ, who doesn't have faith in Him, who isn't sure, who just doesn't know, or that today you would open their eyes to realize that they are in need of a Savior and that there is only one who can save them from their sins, that you would convict them, draw them to repentance, compel them to faith, that they would come from death to life, that you would indwell them with your spirit and make all these things possible for them. But for those of us who are here today who are firmly in Christ and yet who are struggling, I would ask today that you would fill us with a Holy Spirit joy that overflows in us so that we would sing from a genuine place in our hearts. Or that you would fill us with a gratitude that is not our own, so that we might be thankful for everything, that we might have an attitude that praises you in the middle of the darkness because we know that you will never leave us there. Lord, we ask that you would help us as we submit to one another, as we find our place in the authority structures that you have thankfully given us to bring order into our world, and that we would be glad for righteous authority, that we would pray for those in charge of us, And Lord, that you would put good people in those places to lead us in our governments, in our churches, in our our marriages, in our lives, in our worlds. Lord, that you would give us good people to submit to, but even if we don't have good people to submit to, that we would recognize that we are submitted to you and that we would honor you in all of our relationships. Lord, we love you today. And we thank you for all that you are for us in Christ Jesus. And we ask all of these things in His name, by the power of your Spirit. Amen. Amen.